appreciate Brother Angel putting that video together and his prayer was well received and appropriate for today. I've always said that while I understand every person in the world has a certain nationalism and a certain patriotism and that's right and just, nothing wrong with that, but I thank God that he allowed me to be born and live in America. In my opinion, outside of the nation of Israel, which is God's chosen, there's never been a nation like the United States. And so we're thankful and privileged to be here. And part of that is being able to do what we're doing this morning, to open God's Word. So I want to read from 1 Peter chapter 2, and then we're going to turn and read a couple of verses from Acts chapter 5. A very important subject I want to bring today uh, under the title, Walking a Fine Line. Walking a Fine Line. 1 Peter chapter 2 I begin reading in verse 11, down through verse 17. 1 Peter 2, verse 11 through 17. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now go back to Acts chapter 5 for just a couple of verses as we want to bring this companion passage with it. Acts chapter 5 in verses 27 through 29. Acts 5, 27 through 29. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for this purpose that we meet, to glorify Christ, to lift up your great name, Lord, and to preach and teach from your word. God, help us in these trying days we're living as we need to deal with this balance today between the church and the state. Help us to realize our place as citizens, but also as citizens of your kingdom. Bless the message we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated if you would. I want to discuss with you today an issue that's never been more relevant and more crucial, I think, in my entire 35 plus years of ministry and in recent memory for Christians and churches much older than myself. And that issue is this, when do we obey or not obey the government? The present COVID-19 pandemic has brought into the focus of Christians and churches everywhere the pressing question uh, which uh, our answer will have a great effect on ourselves and on other people. Should Christians robotically obey the government no matter what it says, no matter how it affects our Christian beliefs, practices, and testimony? Or on the other hand, should we become radically opposed to anything that the government requests of us as citizens of whatever nation we live in? The way our church answers this question will affect our future membership within, as well as the testimony we have outside. And so it is an issue that we cannot take lightly. Let me rephrase the question. It's really this. What is a Christian's responsibility to human government? Any kind of government. The answer is not as clear-cut as you would think, because it involves many areas of our lives, not just our public worship in the assembly like we're doing now, but our daily lives, because you and I know that true Christianity is not an hour on Sunday kind of religion. It is a 24-7 lifestyle. 
Now, I am particularly sensitive to this subject because I feel a deep burden as a pastor in two areas. First of all, to keep our church together and growing. But also, at the same time, number two, to make sure of how we're being perceived and received by the public around us. And what I mean by the public is primarily the unsaved public. Now, in one of our texts this morning, Peter, the writer, stresses both sides of this question of obeying God and obeying man. But no doubt his emphasis is clearly on our testimony to the world outside. Notice how he said in verse 12, having your conversation, that's your lifestyle, not just your words. King James uses that word to mean everything about your life. Honest among the Gentiles or the unsaved. That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, that's going to happen, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Verse 15 through 17, he says the same thing. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye, Christians, churches, ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, meaning not, not necessarily free because of the government he was talking about. He's talking about we're free in Christ. We have liberty in Christ. But he says, and not using your Christian liberty, not, not to sin, not to do anything wrong, but there are certain things that are not necessarily in and of themselves are wrong, but they may not be the best thing to do at the time. And see, So he says, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness or evil intent. But as the servants of, all, uh, of God, the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, that's the believers, fear God, of course, honor the king. Now, on one hand, we see Peter talking about our testimony without. That's what he said there. But yet on the other hand, it is Peter and the other apostles who are arrested in Acts chapter 5 that we read, and they are forbidden to continue preaching the gospel there in Jerusalem. To which after their arrest and they're standing before their persecutors, the government, the leaders, they said, hey, it, we must obey God rather than men. And so this is the dilemma. This is the fine line that I want to discuss to you today. It's like any fine line that we try to walk in any area of our lives. We have to be careful that we don't fall too much to one side or the other. It takes real discernment to stay balanced in the middle of this line. So let's talk about, first of all, number one, walking the line between two great institutions. Walking the line between two great institutions. Now, you know these two institutions. I'm just going to call them, first of all, the state. First of all, it's the state. We're going to talk about human government. You know human government was ordained of God. It actually started after the flood. Right after Noah got off the ark with his family, God instituted human government. Now, not when I use the word government, we're automatically in our minds led to think a democratic republic where we vote, we have legislative ability. No, that's not what I mean by human government in every case. It just means authority over the people of an area. Okay, There's various kinds of governments. It has been over, over the history of the world. We're not saying we agree with all them, but the idea of having human government or a, an entity that is an authority over the people of an area to ideally create a peaceable life with law and order and, 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 and uh, structure and so on. And so when we talk about the state, started after the flood, it was in various forms, and really it was created for our good. We have to understand that government was God's idea for the good of man. Now, it doesn't mean government always has done what it should and it's overstepped its bounds. We'll talk about that later. But God's idea was for human government. And back in our text from 1 Peter 2, Peter goes into a great section here in verse 13 and 14 telling us about how important human government is. He says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance, that's regulation, legislation, of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, remember they, they lived under a monarchy. They knew nothing about representative government like we enjoy today. This is a new thing relatively in the last couple hundred years that you and I are living under and blessed by today. Most people in the history of mankind have lived under monarchies. It was great when you had a, a benevolent, kind, and, and, and just king, but it wasn't too good when you had a, a, a maniac or a tyrant as the king. But he still says, whether it be the king as supreme 
or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him. Who's, by, who's the him? It's God. For the punishment of evildoers, that's what government's supposed to do, punish evildoers, and bless or reward praise of them that do well. So when we talk about the state, we're talking about human government. Now, on the other hand, we're talking about the church, the two great institutions. The other one is the church. Now, when I use that word today, I'm not using it in a specific biblical ecclesiastical or ecclesi ecclesiology way of the local assembly only. I'm talking about Christians everywhere that meet in churches but live in any country of the world. So understand I'm using that word in, in kind of a more loose way. And what I'm talking about when we talk about these two institutions, it's the difference in your life and my life between the spiritual and the secular the civil and the religious side of life. And it is really pictured by civil government, that's the secular, versus religious institutions. And in, I'm using this very generally. It could be a Christian church, a Jewish synagogue, a Muslim a, a mosque, whatever. We're talking about just the difference between the secular and the spiritual aspects of anyone's life. And we know God mandated for there to be a true, proper separation of church and state. Not how the world uses that phrase today. But God mandated and set up that you would have civil leaders. That was the king in the Old Testament. Israel even had a king, as you know, many kings. And they had a high priest. You had the spiritual side. And so to understand this fine line that we're going to discuss today, you have to see the difference between the two and how we're to blend both into our lives. Every believer, you and I included, throughout the history of the world, has had to walk this fine line between being citizens of a temporal, physical nation, like the United States where we are, but also as Christians to be part of an eternal spiritual kingdom. In that same book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter says of us that are believers, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I'm not talking about a bordered nation. This is a spiritual thing. A peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I think the greatest example perhaps in the Gospels in the life of our Lord to separate the church and state idea was when they brought uh, a dilemma to Jesus one day and said to him, Master, should, should you and your disciples pay your taxes? Remember what Jesus said? He told Peter to get onto the, the sea, the Sea of Galilee, and cast in a, in a, in a line, a hook, and, and pick, a, a, pick out a fish, catch a fish. And as soon as they opened the mouth of the fish, there was a coin inside. And he said, give that coin to, to, uh, to the uh, tax collector. But then he said this. He said also, whose who's superscription, whose picture is on that coin? And they said, well, of course, it's Caesar's. And then he said those famous words, which really are the great balance. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. That's your civil, secular part of your life. You and I have to agree we have a part in that in our lives. We have to be good citizens. But at the same time, he said, but render unto God the things which are God's. And that's our spiritual side. And so when we walk this, this fine line, it's between these two great institutions. Now, let me go on and get a little deeper into this and talk about, first of all, walking this line is difficult. This is number two. Walking this line is difficult. You think how hard it is to walk anything that's, that's narrow, a tightrope, a, a balance beam for these gymnasts. Have you ever seen these drunk drivers trying to do a drunk driving test on walking a line? I've never been there, thank God, but I've seen examples of it. They can't do it, right? It's tough. And I'll tell you, this walking this line is very, very difficult because you have such opposites between the secular and the spiritual. The, the secular world is carnal. It's, it's fleshly. It's worldly. The spiritual, for those of us that are saved and understand that part of our lives, it's to be holy, it's to be special, sacred. It's like the kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of light. And so it's really going to be hard for us as Christians to say, you mean to tell me we're supposed to uh, you know, be balanced in how we deal with this? Yes, we are. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12 Paul says this, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, 
who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. We lived in darkness. The, the kingdom of the God of this world who's the devil. And hath translated us unto the kingdom of his dear son. Do you remember when Pilate was speaking to Christ just before his crucifixion? And he asked Christ, what is truth? Remember that? And he, Jesus told him that uh, he would never understand the truth anyway. And he says to him, uh, are you the king of the Jews then? Are you really the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, I am. And he says, well, if you're the ki uh, a king, you must have a kingdom. Listen to what Jesus' answer was in John 18, 36. My kingdom is not of this world. He's really separating the spiritual and secular kingdoms of the world right there. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence or from here. And so we're talking about the difference in these two kingdoms. Now here's what happens. Here's why this walking this line of, of being a good citizen and, and a good Christian, a good church member. This is the dilemma we're going to try to uh, unfold today and, and try to come to some conclusions. Here's the deal. Not... Everybody in each of these kingdoms perfectly lines up all the time with their kingdom. In other words, uh, there's some people in government that can do good and, and they're good people. You know, we have some good Christian legislators, good people in our government here in Texas and the U.S. government as well. And government can do some good things. So at one time we think of them as secular, carnal, worldly, but they can do some good things. On the other hand, in the kingdom of, of God, there's people who call themselves Christians, may name the name of Christ, that do some very evil things. So there's, there's sometimes it's a little bit skewed out of place there. And so the tendency for people is on each side of, of these two, the kingdom of the state or, or the church, if you will, uh, there's, be a, there's a tendency to despise the other. Well, we naturally know that the, uh, the world, the kingdom of the secular realm, despises the Lord's church, the Lord's people. They've persecuted us all through history. They do today. That's not hard to, to, to ascertain. But here's the key. You and I as Christians can't fall into that uh, extreme in how we treat the world. Just because the state often has persecuted and hated the church, we can't turn around and do the same to the state. Christians are called to walk a higher plane, on higher ground. We're not to fall into the tendency of hating our opposition and those that might be represented by the government systems of the world. Do you remember when Jesus said those monumental words, love your enemies? Do you know pretty much who he had in mind? Now, it was a general statement, can apply to any of your enemies. But you know who he really had in mind most? The Romans. Because there was such an animosity and friction in Israel in those days between how the Jews saw the Romans and the Romans saw the Jews. And he says, love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you and, and evilly uh, treat you and so on. So we must constantly judge how we are walking this fine line. Obeying God, yes, but also trying to do be, uh, try to be good citizens of the nation we live in, no matter what country that is. That leads us to number three. Not only is walking this line difficult, but I want to give you kind of the other side. Walking this line between church and state, the secular and the spiritual, can be done. It can be done. Is it possible for you and I to obey the righteous laws of God, at the same time to obey the laws of men that are often not righteous? Well, my answer is kind of a yes and no. That's kind of going to be the rest of the message. We're going to tell you how yes you can, but sometimes no you can't. So let me give you the yes side first. Since God ordained human government and placed it over our lives, God knew when He... When he permitted and, and planned human government that there would be this struggle that we're discussing today. How can a Christian live in an unrighteous, unholy nation and society? Uh, they've been doing it for 6,000 years, basically, in human history. How can we do it? Well, God gave us some parameters, and we're going to talk about this. Go back to the key passage, as you probably know it, Romans chapter 13. Go back with me. I do want you to turn to this one. Romans chapter 13. And in Romans 13, this is probably the most important passage in the New Testament 
on the Christian's responsibility to human government. But listen to what it says. Romans 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now, he's, he's really making that a general statement. That's saved or unsaved people in a nation. Doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. You're to be subject. You're to submit to the authority of the higher powers, which are government. For there is no power but of God. The powers that are or that be are ordained of God. That means he set them in motion. He permitted them. He allowed them. He ordained them to be so. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. He's talking about rebels. People that overthrow governments. People that are anarchists. That will not submit to any authority and don't believe there's any authority above them. For rulers are not a terror to good works. Now, this is a general statement. Doesn't mean there's not exceptions. There's bad rulers. It's like there's bad citizens. He's saying, as a general rule, this is what God ordained. Here's what he meant for human government to do and to be. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Hey, if you're doing right and you're living the right kind of life, you're living a, a life of, of obedience to God and you're, and you're loving your fellow man, you're loving your family, you're, you're working an honest job and taking care of your family... You don't have to worry about the laws of a just society. They won't be against you, therefore the evil people. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Shouldn't you have a proper respect and fear and reverence for thy government? Do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same. Just like he said in Peter. The government should reward you and, and the government will give you a peaceable life. You should be able to live your life without the government opposing and intervening in your life if you'll live right. For he, the government, that word he is just really the government, is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. That is the permission of capital punishment by the government, by the way. The government does have and should instigate capital punishment when necessary to deter those wicked uh, killers and other criminals in society that make it impossible to live uh, a peaceable life. For he says, For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, it always comes up when you read this passage, the, the first question out of people's minds, and I've already been hinting at it, but let me just touch on it, is what if the government is unjust? What if, the, uh, what if the government is not passing laws that are in line with God's laws, especially directly so? Does that mean that we have the right to be an anarchist, a rebellious person, one that refuses to listen to the authority of the government? No, because you have to understand, what kind of government was in existence when Paul and Peter both wrote their New Testament books? Was it a a democratic republic where they had legislative uh, representation like we do in our, our country where we get to vote and so forth and, and we have elected officials. No, there was no such thing even known by mankind. They were living under the Roman emperors when they wrote this. I've had people say, well, you know, we really can't listen to President Trump because he's probably not even a born-again Christian. That's irrelevant. That question is not even brought up in the text. He's not saying you should only obey. Did you say anything in the text that a ruler had to be a born-again Christian to obey him? No. Just like, how about, how about a Christian husband or a non-Christian husband? Does a Christian wife have, a, have an obligation to submit to her husband if he's not a Christian? She sure does. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you're a Christian or not, not a Christian. And so the key is to understand that we have a responsibility to submit to the government. We're going to talk about the other side of it when there's extremes where we must disobey the government. But as a general rule, God's telling us we've got to obey the government and submit to it. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 1, Paul writes, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, exhort, this is strong language. First of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. Here's why. Here's why we should be good citizens and pray for our leaders, even if they're not Christians, even if they make dumb decisions. We're to pray for them that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, walking this line, I really believe, can be done. First of all, it doesn't have to be either or. Some people in life, they're big about making things either or. They want to go to either extreme. You could do both. In most cases, 
Christians can do both. We're going to talk about the exceptions, but in most cases, you should be able to submit to God and able to submit to the government. In most cases, that is not a problem, if you understand the place of both in your life. Now, there's laws that you and I deal with every day uh, in America that we may not prefer, we may not like to do. Uh, I don't prefer to have to put on a seatbelt every time I get in the car. It's kind of cumbersome. I, I grew up, some of our older folks remember this, we didn't have to worry about seatbelts. We never even touched the things. And all of a sudden, a number of years ago, they made us put seatbelts on. I kind of grumbled about the thing for a while, but you know, I did it. Now, I could be a real anarchist and a real rebel and say, I'm not wearing a seatbelt. And when the police pull me over and see I don't have one on, they try to give me a ticket, I could yell and, and scream at the police officer and tell him he doesn't have the authority to tell me to wear it. There's people that do that. They want to live like that. There's preachers in churches that refuse to pay their taxes, that refuse to take a social security number. They, they live in communes. I mean, it's unbelievable some of the extremes people go to. It does not have to be either or. It should be both. You could be a good citizen of your country and a good Christian at the same time. Okay? You can walk this fine line. And also, it demands, I should say, demands humility to obey both sides. You know, humble people who, who respect others, they don't have a problem with obeying the government and obeying God. If you have a humble spirit, you're not a stubborn person, you're not an arrogant person, you're not a person that thinks my way or the highway. Uh, if, if you're a humble person, you won't have a problem with bringing these two together. Okay? I find that people who don't uh, want to obey either one, either they don't want to obey God or they don't want to obey the government, uh, are usually people who have a problem with humility in general. <laughs> they don't want to follow anything that is against their thinking. And they don't want to ever admit they might be wrong about something. They don't want to ever admit that somebody else has an authority over their lives. These, sadly, are people who usually don't stay married long. They're usually people who don't stay in a job very long. <laughs> you know the kind of people I'm talking about? Because it's got to be their way only. See, if you're humble, you won't have a problem with this line. And lastly, I could say that we could put God first in this without undermining our respect for the government. People say, well, if I make this equal, then I'm making government equal with God. No, we didn't say that at all. We seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. But when you seek God first, then that means you do what God wants you to do. And we've already read in the passages very clearly, God wants you to be a good citizen of the state, the country you live in. He wants you and I to show respect to our leaders, even when we don't agree with them, because it'll have a, an effect on them to make them convicted about their actions against Christians. Now, one vital point before I go on to the last point of the message, and that is that walking this line, this fine line between the church and state, is not as easy for everyone because it depends greatly on the type of government a person lives under. Imagine, if, if you and I lived in another country today that did not have the freedom, for instance, to worship, to assemble, uh, religious freedom we call it, it would be a lot more difficult for us to be talking about obeying the government, obeying God, right? So we have to be sensitive to the fact that some people don't have it as easy to obey the laws of God and, the, and the obey the laws of man at the same time. But we have to remember that Romans 13 and these other passages, all that could be said the same thing, they were not written with an American Democratic Republic type of government in mind. They were not just written for modern day Americans. Hey, we didn't even have religious freedom in our uh, government to the Constitution of 1789. So for 1,700 plus years before the American experiment, which included religious freedom in the First Amendment to our U.S. Constitution, before that nobody knew of freedom of religion and a Republican type rule of law, voting and electing your officials, having representative government. They never knew of that. And so when we talk about this balance we're trying to see here, have some compassion and sensitivity towards people who live in other countries. Imagine if you were a Christian living in China this morning. You don't have the freedom to do what you and I are doing right now. You wouldn't be able to meet. There's millions of Chinese Christians persecuted to the death who are living under the radar, have to meet in house churches in the dark at night in places where they can't be seen by the communist government and all of its tentacles around that huge country. Imagine if you lived in a, an Islamic country like Saudi Arabia or one of those over in the Middle East. 
Again, do the things I'm talking about today from the Bible apply to them as well as us? Yes, they do. But they may not be able to be lived out exactly the same way. And so when I'm hearing and reading of Christians in other parts of the world and, and I see things that they do, I have to be compassionate, I have to be understanding. You know, uh, I might not have done it the same way they, they did it, but remember, I don't live under the same situation they do. So these principles apply to anywhere you live, but we have to understand that they're going to be carried out a little bit differently according to the government we're under. And so that brings me to the last point. I gave you the yes, meaning can we obey God and, and the government? I think we can in most cases. And now I've got to give you the last point. When walking this line becomes impossible. When walking this line becomes impossible. This is what we call civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is taught in the Bible. It's shown in the Scriptures. And those famous words of, of Peter when he said, we ought to obey God rather than men, that's what he was saying. When any law of man directly, absolutely, clearly violates the law of God, and I'm talking about for moral issues, issues of the heart and the soul, when God, or man's laws violate God's laws, then we must make a decision to obey God's laws first. But even when we do that, even when we break man's law to keep God's law, we have to be careful how we do that. See, the principle of civil disobedience isn't just that you disobey the, the government. How do you disobey the government? In what tone, in what spirit, in what way do you and I disobey? Do you know Peter and John and, and Paul later and many early Christians, when they disobeyed the government, we'll look at a couple examples in a minute, uh, they did so in a way of being willing to pay the consequences of their disobedience without causing a riot, without causing an upheaval and, and asking the people in a community to rise up and overthrow the government. They took personal responsibility for their decision and they were willing to suffer whatever the consequences. They were jailed, they were whipped, they were martyred, we know. And so when you and I disobey the human government, to obey God's government, we, have, we better do it in a personal way first and don't expect others to suffer with us. Hey, I'm going to make a personal decision to obey God first. I better be willing to pay whatever the price is. Do you know that sometimes... When God's people were uh, uh, punished, arrested, whatever, or threatened by obeying God rather than the laws they lived uh, under the government they lived in, uh, sometimes they fled for their lives. That was proper. At times it was proper. Remember when God sent his angel and released Peter out of prison in Acts chapter 12? Shows you that God was perfectly uh, for this idea that sometimes the best thing to do is, is flee, to leave. And he released Peter out of, out of that jail. Now, how we disobey the laws of man, to obey the law of God, depends a lot about the nation we live under and what laws we're living under. Let me give you some examples. Abortion. Abortion is justified, is permitted in America because of our Supreme Court and legislators have allowed it and permitted it. Does that mean that myself as a Christian living in America have to say that I agree with that law? No. I am to oppose that law because it opposes the law of God. To kill an innocent child in the womb is wrong. It is murder. And we ought to oppose it by any means possible. But here's where we get into this idea, does the ends justify the means? You know this well as I do that... Many people have taken it in hand to bomb uh, abortion clinics, to kill abortion doctors. I do not believe the ends justify the means. See, in America at least, we have the power of the ballot. And so it ought to be ballots and not bullets. Right? You've heard that phrase. Ballots and not bullets. You and I ought to oppose things in a passive way, not in a, a, a violent, threatening way. You never see where the Christian, you ever see the New Testament Christians taking up arms? Paul never got the group of, of a church together and said, let's, let's, uh, let's all arm ourselves tonight and go attack Festus or Felix or let's go march on Rome. <laughs> they never said that. They never did that. When they were disobeying the law of men, they were willing to pay whatever price that was put out to them to do. And they, and they were willing to do that. Well, how about the idea of 
the Bible permitting self-defense, and it does permit, I think, national defense. Do you know when a country is, is threatened by tyrannical governments, and it's happening right in this very day that we're living. There's Christians living in North Korea, China, other places like that. Do Christians have the right to not only go against or oppose such a government, but in certain cases to rise up in self-defense of their lives and, as, and, and for their country to defend their country by means of warfare if necessary? I think they are given that ability and given that permission. doesn't mean it always is going to happen. Do you know in the book of Judges, that's exactly what God permitted Israel to do? In Israel, in the period of the Judges, because of their sin, God let some, God allowed some pagan nation, the Midianites, the Philistines, the Canaanites, whoever it was, to oppress them. Remember what God did? He raised up a judge. There was 12 of them total. And each one of them did what? He basically raised up an army to overthrow the government that was oppressing them. I've heard Christians, well-known Christian speakers, get up and say, we didn't really have a right to overthrow King George in the Revolutionary War. I thought, what are you talking about, friend? That's not biblical. The Bible gives you that right. And you know, if, if people in North Korea or in China or something were able, and this is, their, this is their liberty to do it or not, we're not judging them if they don't, but I'm saying if they rose up to overthrow a government that kills and, and, uh, and, and violates and threatens and imprisons and persecutes Christians to the death. If they rise up against it, they have every right to do that. I think self-defense is also given as a national thing for nations. Hey, if you were living in Germany during the Nazi uh, regime, did you have a right to overthrow their government? Y yeah, you did. We, w we would have wished some of them would have uh, assassinated Hitler before he did what he did, but they weren't able to do it. Civil disobedience is taught in the Scriptures. In Daniel 6, Daniel was commanded by the king, King Darius, not to pray to any other god for 30 days but to Darius. Remember what he did? He went back up into his, his, his uh, room, looked over to Jerusalem, and prayed three times a day nonetheless. And he was arrested. He was thrown in the den of lions. And you know what happened? There's many examples of civil disobedience in the New Testament. Paul, for instance, he was a Roman citizen. Paul was arrested a number of times, put in prison. He was whipped, mistreated. But he always used his Roman citizenship to say that it was wrong on how he was being treated. And several occasions, I won't read them for sake of time, but he, he made a, a, a definite uh, case for himself to say it was wrong that you whip me, that you imprison me or people with me because we have rights. And he played on those rights. He thought it was, it was right to do so. But you know what? Paul and Peter and the other guys in the New Testament, when they were persecuted, they never were disrespectful. I was always interested to see, like in Acts 26, here's Paul. He's going to defend himself before this wicked king named Agrippa. This guy's a puppet king of Rome anyway. He's not even a just a leader. But do you notice Paul never speaks disrespectfully to him? He never uh, uses harsh, bombastic, rude language toward, he never calls them names, he never says, hey, you don't have any right to be what you're, no, he, he says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, speaking respectfully, he says down in verse 24, and as he thus spake Paul, for himself Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. Here's a guy, Festus, who's the Roman official uh, during this preaching session that he's defending himself, he says, you're a nut, Paul. I mean, that's pretty derogatory. You're crazy, man. This is what Paul says. But he said, I am not bad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Hey, if that would have been me, I probably would have given a few other choice words to Mr. Festus at that point. But Paul was still very respectful. So to sum up this balance... We are to obey the laws of man as long as they do not directly violate the laws of God. And then when we do disobey the laws of men, we need to be very careful that we do so in a loving, a, a respectful way to keep our testimony as not being haters of the world, but to be lovers of the world, of men. Let's put it that way. Paul said it beautifully in Romans 12, 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Do you know the statement, the blood of the martyrs 
is the seed of the church. You've probably heard that. In Christian history, you'll see that statement. You know why it's true? Why was it the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church? It wasn't just because martyrs were willing to die for the Christian faith in horrendous ways, burned at the stake, thrown in sacks and rivers and drowned, stoned, beheaded, poisoned, starved. I mean, all kinds of stuff you can read. Why was it their blood became a strengthening thing for the church? Because it was how they died. It was how they died. I've made a study of church history for many, many years and read many accounts of these martyrs. There's not a single martyr I know of that went to the stake or went to their death yelling out about the, the Catholic system or about the, the government or the marshals or the Beatles, whatever they were called, who brought them to their deaths. They respectfully went so without fighting, without resisting, singing the psalms, preaching to the people as they were put at the stake. That's why they won so many people over. I want to end by saying I see some disturbing conditions in America coming from the response to this COVID-19 pandemic. And it's really on both sides of the issue. There are groups that are telling us that the government has no right to tell us anything, and so we ought to rebel. It's this anarchy, anti-government, anti-police mentality. I cannot join such groups. I cannot be a part of such groups because I don't think it's biblical. But let me give you a swing the pendulum the other way and say that there is now in our midst a heavy-handed tyranny in some government areas to shut churches down, to use this pandemic as a means to further an atheistic agenda that doesn't want the churches to ever be opened up again. We need to be very careful of that as well. I was reading a couple of things online. I've been really interested in this issue because it's really out there right now. But I was reading a man who wrote a couple of things, and I thought it was really good I put it. He said, today, as we have begun the process of being in life again after the initial attack of the coronavirus, we have seen the effects of officials duly elected by the people overstepping the Constitution and the willingness of the people to let them. We have also seen how something as small as a virus can radically change our way of life. One of the most significant ways has been in the $2.5 trillion stimulus package, more coming, while most of the money, though created out of thin air, is being used to assist Americans to get through this pandemic, it has also opened a can of worms our forefathers warned us about. The key to our nation's survival is based upon the intent of our forefather, that our forefathers pushed of limiting the power of government. Unfortunately, some of our leaders' responses to this crisis has only created a people more dependent on government and government expanding in its scope of control. When this happens, it is the citizens, or should I say a Christian's responsibility, to remove the leadership and reboot back to the constitutional republic that our forefathers intended. So where does that leave us as Christians? Our nation is built upon biblical principles, and it is up to us to see those principles which are evidenced in the Constitution that they are followed. It is always right to be involved in doing good. James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. We have a God-given responsibility to pray for our leaders to do right. We also have been given the privilege to vote for morally right and constitutionally uh, follow, uh, followed leaders. Some of us may run for these positions of leadership ourselves. Lastly, hopefully it will never come to this, but it is right to overthrow the leadership when our national leaders circumvent and overstep their authority as laid out clearly in the U.S. Constitution. Many good points the man brings up. You have heard, I hope you heard about this, that some of these states, and our president was referring to these such governors when he had his uh, briefing this past Thursday, I believe it was, to urged the, gov the governors, and, and upon a pretty strong statement, said, if you don't, I'll make sure you do, uh, to reopen their churches. Such a governor, and I didn't get her first name, but in the state of Maine, can you imagine this? If I was a resident in the state of Maine, I would have to be at the state capitol protesting this kind of nonsense. Their governor, her last name is Mills, I didn't get her first name in this article, it says, here's, here's what a little bit of the article said about this liberal Democratic governor who is forcing the churches to remain closed, while other things are reopening already, but forcing the churches to remain closed. She's come up with this idea of a badge that a church has to get to show they're complying. Listen to what it says. Churches that fully comply with Governor Mills' demands whenever they are revealed are 
are approved by her and will be given a badge to display outside their church indicating the church has fully complied and is approved by Governor Mills. The guy goes on in the article and says, the very idea of government or governor-approved churches <laughs> flies in the face of both the First Amendment and biblical principles of governance and lawful authority. Can you imagine a, a woman, a governor, claiming that when she says the churches can reopen? That is an abuse of power, and one of these areas I've told you about that we need to be very careful of these extremes. As we march closer to the coming of Christ, friends, God's army of passive, peaceful lovers of men must be very careful how we discern between putting God first and keeping our testimony to the world around us. The time of outright civil disobedience may indeed come. I have to warn you, I think it probably will. But even then, we'll have to do so in disobeying the human government to obey God's laws. We have to do so in the right spirit. Like past generations, we have to take the right stands and be willing to pay whatever the cost to put God first. But until that time of direct outward civil disobedience, I think we need to be careful that we do not drive a wedge between ourselves, our churches, our church in particular, and the unsaved community around us. We need to be peaceful, loving citizens but always recognizing we are citizens of heaven first. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're going to have a verse or two of invitation. We'll ask if God leads you to come forward that you would. I want you to think about this as a very, very crucial subject because it's really in the forefront right now and becoming more so every day with this reopening that's happening, different states having different things happening, and then there's the issue of different countries. I told you about my son in Scotland. They're, they're still closed down, and he's getting more and more frustrated, so are the churches there. It, it's coming to a forefront, and I, uh, coming to the forefront, and I don't know what this means for end-time scenario. I don't know what, how this is leading to the coming of Christ. I just know Christ is coming soon. He may use these events of this coronavirus and, and things that have happened because of it to, to, to come and to bring the world to a condition of his, of his return. I do know this. You and I individually, as citizens of this great country, citizens of the state of Texas, of our own community, as well as saved people that are members of Arlington Baptist Church, we've got to make sure we get this fine line right. It's not always easy. And I'm not saying I've always gotten it right. And, and I don't think we should ever be judgmental towards another believer because, man, this is a personal thing. And, and many times how a church handles things, other churches may not understand. Hey, I might hear of a church that does something and I don't quite understand it, but maybe I don't know all the details. I'm not a member of that church. I don't know the discussions they've had. I don't know the back, behind closed doors discussions the leaders have had either. So we have to be careful. Don't become really dogmatic too much on this, but you've got to realize there's a principle. We ought to obey God, but we ought to obey the, the government as well. And as, as long as we can do both, we ought to try to do both. If the time comes we can't, then we put that in God's hands. I'm going to pray. If something has touched your heart today, I want you to take this time to pray specifically and individually. I hope generally you'll just pray for our church. It's, it's, it's a, a tough time. And as things reopen, you know, things are going to happen. And we might have another breakout of this virus later in the year, they're, they're warning. And what are we going to do then if we have to close again? There's all kinds of things that can come up. And we need to think this thing through. Let's pray. Father, I pray for this invitation time that, Lord, we'd all consider this fine line that your word declares. It's, it's scriptural. You wanted human government to be in the place it is, mostly to create a peaceful life that we would have order, we'd have laws, we'd have the rebuke of evil and the, and the reward of good. Uh, Lord, that we would live a peaceable life. And so we do want to pray for our president, pray for our governor, pray for the Congress, every state and local official. Lord, these people, many of who are not Christians, we know many of them have evil intents and we don't agree with much of what's being done, but yet you told us to pray for them. And I pray they'll repent. I pray any who have evil intentions will see the evil of their way and, and give it up. And Lord, that more of our leaders would be saved and turn to Christ and more Christians will get into office to, to help influence our nation, our, our country, our state, our local governments as well. And God, help us to be good citizens, never to come across as riotous uh, people of rebellion, 
a people of stubborn uh, uh, threats and danger to the government and those who would uprise for anything to overthrow the government. Lord, help us to realize that our testimony as a church and as individual Christians is being watched all the time. Lord, speak to every heart. Now bless this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name.